How's it going, my dudes? This video is brought to you by Squarespace today. We've all heard of bottle shows, but what exactly are they? Well, in a very simple way, it's a way to save money. You try and restrict the use of sets and other such expenses. Stick to what you already have standing there already. Now, that's not to say that every member of this list has strictly adhered to those rules, but if there's something Star Trek does very, very well, it's a bottle show. With that in mind, I'm Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture, and here are the 10 greatest Star Trek bottle episodes. Number 10, A Night in Sickbay. Full disclosure, I hate this episode. Okay, I realise that's strong words. The idea might have been cute, but the execution sets my teeth on edge. However, it's a perfect example of a bottle show. The one hailing from Enterprise. So I'm going to swallow that bile for a second. I'm going to carry on. Porthos is sick. That's enough to rally most Trekkies up in arms and save the best crewman on the ship. Dr. Flock says that only time will tell if he'll make it, so his dutiful best friend... Captain Archer vows to stay by his side through the night. The episode, in truth, should have been so much funnier than it ended up becoming. Archer is on edge throughout, Phlox is on <clears throat> full display, and we are treated to a plethora of exotic alien animal life. Though, of course, we get a happy ending. S seriously, like, can you imagine if Porthos didn't make it? Yeah, no, riots in the streets. Unfortunately, the episode falls a bit flat when all of its components come together. Still, no one can argue that it didn't save the show a bit of money, so stuffed doggo or no, I've got to tip my cap to this episode. Number 9. Distant Voices Distant Voices is a third season entry from Deep Space Nine. Oh, uh, must have been trying to tighten the belt a bit that year. Though when one considers episodes like Past Tense and The Die is Cast, it begins to make a bit more sense. This is an idea that the show would revisit several more times in its run. Empty the station, turn off all the lights, and hey presto, spooky scenery. Bashir, suffering from a Lethian psychic attack, wanders the corridors of his mind, represented by familiar locations, the standing sets. It was Ronald D. Moore's idea to set the action aboard the station, while the idea of not using regular actors was nixed early on. Andrew Robinson was delighted to play this version of Garrick, with Alexander Siddig commenting, pre-filming, that this story was a challenge, having to take the character and age him up so much, all within the confines of 44 minutes. The gamble paid off, as did the efforts of Michael Westmore. This episode won an Emmy Award for Outstanding Individual Achievement in Makeup for a Series, beating Voyager's faces to the punch. Number 8. One. One is a later episode in Voyager's fourth season, serving as an effective two-hander between Jerry Ryan and Robert Picardo. The episode's conceit sees the crew placed in stasis for a month-long trip through a dangerous nebula, with only the Doctor and Seven immune to its effects. Cue hijinks! This was a heavy episode for Ryan to film, as she is effectively in every scene. As the episode progresses, her co-stars get fewer and fewer, until eventually it's just her. Director Kenneth Biller reflected that she was a pleasure to work with, was always present and ready, and managed the script, despite its hyper-reliance on her. The stasis chamber set was a reuse of Seven's cargo bay, while the pods themselves had previously appeared in The Thaw and Resolutions, another cost-saving technique as the season prepared to ramp up for the finale, Hope and Fear. A fun production fact saw the filming for one run late one evening on the 26th of February 98, only to begin filming again in the morning, while production on the series finale had to patiently wait for the lead actors to get out of burn makeup from this episode. Number 7. The Doomsday Machine the Doomsday Machine is a slight outlier on this list, as it featured new sets that debut, yet all of the action takes place, bar effects, on board the two ships Enterprise and Constellation, with a few key moments featuring a shuttlecraft as well. So much of the story revolves around Decker's fallout from the Planet Killer's consumption of his crew, as well as Kirk's attempts to retake his ship from afar, that it finds itself here. Saying that, the redesigned engineering set appears for the first time here, as does the antechamber where Kirk spends most of the episode. The Doomsday Machine is iconic for its depiction of the huge space sock sucking up planets and repelling phaser fire, but the core of the story centres on Decker's descent into madness, battling with Spock as he goes. Kirk displays his calm as he pilots the constellation into the maw of the machine. All of this, of course, takes place on either the standing set of the Enterprise Bridge or this new chamber. Number 6. Time Squared the fun thing about Time Squared is how it handles time travel. In almost all cases before this episode, time travel was simply a means to an end, whales or no whales. Here, however, there is a tangible effect on Picard as he travels into the past, including nausea, dizziness, 
and death. The last one may have come from the other Picard's phaser, it's not important. What's important here is that the central idea, Picard goes six hours back in time, is fascinating. Never before had such a short hop back in time been explored, thus adding a level of tension to events as the clock is an awful lot shorter than we'd been used to. There is a version of the story that would have seen this as a prequel to Q Who. Morris Hurley felt that the episode was weaker for the removal of Q as the cause, feeling that the Enterprise simply flying into the Mobius was an anticlimactic ending. This, then, is one of the tantalising hints that the Q arc we would have seen through the Next Generation's second season. Number 5. Magic to make the sanest man go mad this one, according to producer Aaron Harberts, was designed to save money, let there be no doubt about that. The time loop was a handy way of keeping all of the action in a set amount of spaces without having to consistently add new locales. This also allows the episode to play with the form. In a move similar to The Next Generation's cause and effect, this episode locks the characters into a time loop, gradually becoming aware, or at least having Stamets retain his knowledge, along with Rain Wilson's returning Harry Mudd. The episode, for all of its cost saving, ends up being one of the more enjoyable, and certainly one of the more silly episodes in Discovery's first season. Hindsight adds a slightly savage satisfaction in seeing Lorca bumped off the mortal coil again and again, but to expand there would venture into spoiler territory. Anthony Rapp commented that the episode was a frantic one to film, with many moving parts. The party scene alone took four days to complete, so even with the show setting firmly in the bottle show camp, it wasn't necessarily the quickest turnaround of a script in Star Trek history. Number four, The Adversary. Closing out DS9's third season is the paranoid thriller The Adversary. While there have been other plans for the season's end that had to be put on hold, though would eventually surface as Homefront and Paradise Lost, this show, set almost exclusively aboard the Defiant, truly ratches up the threat of the Changelings. Lawrence Pressman returned to Deep Space Nine, having previously appeared as Takeni Gamor, as Ambassador Krajensky, at least to start with. The episode borrows from The Thing From Another World, the 1951 adaptation of John W. Campbell Jr.'s Who Goes There. The isolation, along with the very real threat that the co-opted Defiant poses helps to build the tension throughout. The episode also builds on the premise that no changeling has ever harmed another, a phrase that had been repeated several times through the series' third season. Odo and Krajensky's final fight in engineering sets one of the largest plot threads in Star Trek history into motion, not least with the final warning, you are too late, we are everywhere. That the episode achieves its aims while barely leaving the Defiance confines is a triumph. Number three, where silence has lease. Where Silence Has Lease is an early episode of The Next Generation's second season, featuring a vocal performance from The Terminator's Earl Bowen as the ghostly apparition of Nagilam. Though the episode features nebulae, holes in space and Romulan warbirds, it never truly leaves the Enterprise's sets. Director Winwood Colby was introduced to Star Trek in this outing and would go on to direct such episodes as All Good Things. He found the restriction of having to film primarily on the bridge challenging. As he described it, visiting the bridge was exciting. Remaining on the bridge was dull, tan walls, that carpet, and not much space to move. This pushed him into more choreography than had previously been seen on the ship, as well as playing with the effects to keep things interesting. When Riker and Worf board the Yamato, the background hum of the bridge noises is slightly off, signifying that all is not well on board the ship. Showrunner Morris Hurley was pleased with how the episode played out, enjoying that it pushed the scientific sides of these characters a little further than an encounter with the Ferengi or even the Borg may have done. Number two, Lower Decks. Lower Decks is an episode that has such a strong legacy that it can sometimes be easy to forget it was a bottle show. The Next Generation's seventh season is dotted with gems, if perhaps the year overall meandered here and there. Lower Decks is a particular highlight, and Shannon Phil's almost final turn as Seto Jaxa stands above all else. Though the action rarely leaves the Enterprise in this episode, switching the focus to these junior officers allowed audiences a fresh glance at the inner workings of the flagship. We were already familiar with Nurse Ogawa and, of course, Seto, but all five, let's not forget Ben, of these people stand out. The episode is of course most famous for its crushing finale, but stands as a perfect example of how to handle a cost-saving exercise and still deliver on the promise of exploration and interpersonal relationships. Though the mean folk over on Star Trek Lower Decks seem to have confirmed Seto's death, we still cling to no body, no death. So here, for now, Seto still lives, perhaps having adventures in the shuttle with her new Cardassian friend. One can but dream. Number one, Shuttlepod One. 
Shuttlepod 1 has taken on a life of its own, with dramatic readings of the script to mark the episode's anniversary and an entire podcast featuring Connor Trenier and Dominic Keating. But the original episode was intended to be a small-scale event. Small-scale, that is, in that only six of the show's main cast members appear on screen. The bulk of the story takes place in the eponymous craft, with the audience watching Trip and Reed grow their beards, wrap up in blankets, and comment on their colleagues' bums while oxygen levels drop. The episode is perhaps best remembered for truly humanising Reed, who until that point had been a little rigid in his role as tactical officer. Here, we learned that he was, in fact, a raging Lothario back on Earth. Trip listens to him record his various goodbye letters to his various lovers, and both character and audience alike are a bit shocked. As often happens with bottle shows, this instalment became a favourite of cast and fans alike. Manny Cotto wrote a reference to this story into the script for Similitude, the third season episode that broke hearts worldwide, with Keating in particular citing this episode as his favourite outing. Dudes, it's your favourite Rysian meteorologist Chad Torka here to tell you about the awesomeness of Squarespace. They've got the next generation of technology with their fluid engine. You know me, my friends. I'm Salt the Riser. I don't get that techno babble. So when I talk about fluid engine and how awesome Squarespace is to use, even I can use it. If I can, you can. They can even help you make custom merch. Sign Chad Torka neck brace is coming soon. And you can sell it via the online store that ya they offer. And when you're ready to rip some waves like me, go to squarespace.com forward slash trackculture for a free trial and for 10% off your first website or domain purchase. You're awesome, my dudes. Do the awesome thing. Chad Tarka out. For all of you asking such questions as, Sean, where the hell is cause and effect? We've got to have a second list, don't we? So let us know what you would like to see in the comments below. And don't forget to get in touch with us over on Twitter at Trek Culture. We're on Blue Sky and we're on TikTok as well at Trek Culture. We're on Instagram at Trek Culture YT. I am, of course, at Sean Ferrick on the various socials and our lovely editor Tom is at Tom C. Finn on the various socials too. You look after yourself until I'm talking to you again. And if you need to save a bit of money, you never know. Might end up being one of the most favorite things people have ever seen you do. What a strange way to end this video. Live long and prosper, folks. Thanks.